welcome good morning good morning my dear good morning good morning brother good morning very dear brother good morning so nice to see both of you in the morning same here ji Shri, ma'am, uh, you are not audible. Yeah, yeah. Am I audible now? Yes, yeah, yes, ma'am. Now. And with the permission of the honorable chair and our worthy vice chancellor, should I start the floor, ma'am? Start, start, beta. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. A very good morning to one and all present here. I, Dr. Sandreshwar Minhas, on behalf of Center of Environment and Disaster Management, as PNL Shimla hereby welcome the distinguished panel of speakers, Professor Dr. Gudeep Singh Bhari, Chancellor, IMS Unison University, Dehradun, Uttarakhand, Professor Dr. P.S. Jaswal, Vice Chancellor, SRM University, Delhi, NCR, Sonipat, Haryana, Professor Dr. Nishta Jaswal, our worthy Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. S.S. Jaswal, Registrar HPNL Ushimla, Director CEDM, faculty members, participants, and students. Today's ECRO camp is organized to commemorate 37 years of Bhopal gas disaster. The theme of the colloquium is Bhopal gas tragedy, some unanswered questions. The purpose of this ecloquium is to cause Reflection on the world's worst industrial disaster occurred in, the Bhopal, occurred in Bhopal in the night of December 2nd and 3rd, 1984, which raised many complex legal issues. Hence, this colloquium tries to put reflection which have been discovering and raising crucial questions since 37 years relating to unchecked hazardous industrial activities, the traces of which are still visible. To begin with, I take this opportunity to most humbly request Professor Dr. S. S. Deswar, Deswar H. N. L. Shimla, to welcome the dignitaries. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. S. Chandrashri. Professor Gurdeep Singh Bari, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Honorable Chancellor, IMS, Indian University, Dehradun. Professor P. N. Deswar, Honorable Vice Chancellor, SR University, Sonipat, Haryana. Professor Nishta Jaswal, Honorable Vice Chancellor, National University, Shimla. Dr. Gurjay Shukla, Director, Center for Environment and Disaster Management, Himachal Pradesh National University, Shimla. Dr. Chandrishi Minas, Program Coordinator, Faculty Members, Dear Students, and Participants. Today we are connected here with our e colloquium, that's being organized by Center for Environment and Disaster Management on 37 years of Bhopal Grass Disaster on the theme, Bhopal gas tragedy, some unanswered question. Bhopal disaster is the worst industrial extent in the history of chemical leak that happened on 3rd December 1984 in the city of Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh. This disaster killed thousands of people immediately. The final death toll was estimated to be between 15,000 and 20,000 and some media reports say that it is it was between 16,000 and 30,000. Those who survived, they suffered respiratory problems, eye irritations, or blindness, and other maladies resulting from exposure to the toxic gas. We are honored and privileged to having distinguished panel of speakers with us. All the panelists is having vast experience in academics, research, and administration. On behalf of the university, I take this opportunity to welcome our chief guest of this program, Professor Gurdeep Singh Bari, for this program today, this morning. Welcome, sir. This program is being presided over by Professor P.S. Jaswal, 
ऑनरेबल वाइस चांसलर एस आर एम यूनिवर्सिटी सोनीपत हरियाणा सर वॉर वेलकम टू यू ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ दूनिवर्सिटी फॉर ज्वाइनिंग दिस प्रोग्राम दिस मॉर्निंग आई एस आल्सो वेलकम प्रोफेसर मिस्टर जसवाल ऑनरेबल वाइस चांसलर नेशनल यूनिवर्सिटी शिमला मैम विल बी प्रेजेंटिंग इंट्रोडक्शन टू द थीम वेलकम यू मैम ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द सेंटर फॉर दिस प्रोग्राम finally i welcome all the participants connected with us in this morning for this program welcome one and all please over to chandeshi mana chandeshi not audible thank you sir we have with us our worthy vice chancellor my guru professor dr nishta deswal whose consistent and infinite dedication for her profession makes ma'am an extraordinary woman and it is a role model ma'am is a role model for all of us at hpn lu shimla and it's my privilege and honor to introduce ma'am to this audience professor dr nishta jaiswal has more than generationally generationally i think we must save time <laughs> Okay, ma'am. Now all of you know me. In fact, uh, I just uh, uh, I will invite ma'am, Dr. Nishta Jaiswal, to introduce the theme of today's program. And with these lines to ma'am, शायद इतना कहना काफी होगा कि ये एक ऐसी बच्चा है जिन्हें भारत के सर्वोच्च न्यायालय ने अपनी टिप्पणियों और फैसलों में अंकित किया है. And ma'am needs no introduction. May I now invite Professor Dr. Nishta Jaiswal to introduce the theme of the today's program? Thank you, Dr. Chandreshwari. Very rightly, you said we are here to commemorate the tragic night. Yes, we must keep on refreshing our memories so that we learn some lessons that it should not happen again. 37 years of human history beginning from the intervening night of 2nd and 3rd december 1984 stands as a proof of human greed human errors no repentance irresponsible behavior irresponsible care and how the even the temples of justice failed how could we continue with our faith on different organs of the state i understand it might have caused some improvements in industrial safety procedures but still there are many questions unanswered all of us know disasters may be natural disasters may be man made i'm reminded of a shloka yavanam dhan sampati prabhutvam vivekita ek ekam api anarthaye kimu yatra chatushtayam which means youth prosperity of wealth power of authority and lack of right judgment each one can prove to be catastrophic if we analyze what happened during this bhopal gas tragedy i think prosperity of wealth is use of authority or power of authority and even lack of judgment at least these three played a role even though we we are not sure whether we can refer to the role of any youth here all of us know as dr chandreshuri has also talked about that how due to leakage of the toxic gas mic lot of loss of life was there i am not going to refer to any numbers i am not going to refer to how much compensation has been paid till date because these are only numbers for me and all of us are well aware that official reports are always different from the reality but we need to turn back the pages of history to see 
how much negligent we were. If we look at the newspaper reports before that, they were warning, save, please, the city. And warning was there because there was some mild leakage in 1981 also. But we did not bother. Even after the tragedy occurred, it was decided by the owners to say that it is because of some disgruntled person's sabotage, which could not be proved ultimately. We had unshaken faith in the judiciary, but until date, we have not been able to decide. I will not say regarding compensation, I'll say adequate compensation. I understand even Brundtland Commission was constituted in 1983. By 1984, we had not globally defined what is sustainable development. But during the course of time, we talked about sustainable development. We talked about number of principles, polluter phase principle, precautionary principle, intergenerational equity. I, the judicial hands were tight. Let us not face the consequences. Whatever has happened has been badly criticized. I will again say, I am not going to refer to any numbers. I would like to quote Wallace Mendelssohn. I quote, this in the present times, not only in the present times, since time immemorial, we had been talking about rule of law. I quote, in this imperfect legal setting, we expect the judges to clear their endless dockets, uphold the rule of law, and yet not utterly disregard our need for the discretionary justice of Plato's philosopher king. Judges must be sometimes cautious and sometimes bold. Judges must respect both the traditions of the past and the convenience of the present. Judicial saga shows how the plaintiffs in such situations they pass through a torturous and burdensome judicial labyrinth full of legal obstacles. We always fight for a test of reasonableness to prove the suitability of the forum, the impossibility of piercing the wheel to show the accountability of the corporate web, invoking human and environmental rights with no effect whatever. We have been fighting the fight of legitimacy test. Test to the rule of law, having fulfilled the fundamental mission, namely to protect the citizen's interest. Reality is very bitter and it's very, very difficult to accept the reality that under these circumstances, we always fight unequal legal battles. We keep on fighting for years together. And then suddenly one day we realize that the predictions of many experts prove. I will not take much time. I'll play, leave place for the experts. I'm not entering into technicalities or legalities when I refer to unanswered questions. But my soul is also asking certain questions which have remained unanswered. Have we resolved or decided about the mode of compensation? Till date, better to say, adequate compensation, whether inquiries and investigations are farce when it comes to human life vis-a-vis -vis power of authority. 
all of us are aware of that law of nuclear energy has been passed. We need to analyze that law also because ultimately we have to put on balance on the one side this dealing with the nuclear energy, the development on and on the other side, human and natural resources, especially human life. The issue of corporate irresponsibility is still haunting us. Do we want that there was Jallianwala Bagh tragedy, man-made tragedy? And we had this Bhopal gas tragedy. Apart from many other tragedies, disasters, emergencies we have already faced. Should we continue facing all this? I would like to quote Rebecca Solnit. She's an American writer, she's a feminist, and perhaps I may be biased, but only a feminist can say so. I quote, there are disasters that are entirely man-made, but none that are entirely natural. And I will conclude with my own written poem on this Bhopal guest tragedy. Koi shahar neend mein so jayega aisa so jana tha. Koi shahar neend mein so jayega aisa so jana tha. Zahreeli gaiso mein kho jayega aisa so jana tha. Udyog se khushali ki chaha badhal karegi so jana tha. Chehre ki mustan pe aansu ki lakeere banegi. इंसानियत की कीमत अदालत से मांगनी पड़ेगी सोचा न था मानव अधिकार की जंग अदालत में छिड़ेगी सोचा न था विश्व सम्मेलनों और और कानूनों की युग खिल्ली उड़ेगी सोचा न था पीढ़ियां प्रगति के नाम से सहम सी जाएंगी सोचा न था न एहतियात न पछतावा होगा किसी को ऐसा भी सोचा न था राष्ट्रता धर्म जाति रंग इन पर जीवन का मूल्य अंकेगा सोचा न था सतत विकास के नियम बांध भी उनसे चुकेगा कोई सोचा न था सब होने पे भी कोई चैन से सोएगा सोचा न था एरब एरब तोड़ दे लालच के महल जिनमें रहना सोचा न था अहम न करे जिंदगियों के फैसले क्यों ऐसा सोचा न था अहम करे जिंदगियों के फैसले क्यों ऐसा सोचा न था सर्वे भवंतु थैंक यू मैम मैम आई कंप्लीटली एग्री विद यू दैट रियलिटी इज बेटर एंड इट इज डिफिकल्ट टू एक्सेप्ट द रियलिटी एंड एज uh, we are fighting together for for getting the adequate compensation to the victims of Bhopal. Thanks again, ma'am. Now I would like to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Dr. Paranjit Singh Jaswal, my esteemed guru, my mentor, my guide. Professor Dr. Jas uh, Paranjit Singh Jaswal, as yes. educationist, a legal educator, we is presently the vice chancellor. Uh, we know each other. I think we will continue with the topic. Uh, <laughs> Sir, it will be my privilege and honor to, to introduce you. Okay. <laughs> uh, is presently the Vice Chancellor of SRM University, Delhi NCR, Sonipat, Haryana. Sir is the former Vice Chancellor of Rajiv Gandhi National Law University, Patiala. Former Chairperson of Department of Laws, Punjab University, Chandigarh. Sir has a vast, rich teaching experience over 40 years and Sir has published a number of edited books, journals and in fact delivered lectures in various national and international conferences. Sir, the various awards, in fact he's a recipient of various fellowships award such as the Haru Centenary British Fellowship Award for the year 1991-92 for doing postdoctoral research in the Department of Law, School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. 
completed a course on human rights at the International Institute of Human, human Rights France, also did an intensive training in the International Center for University Human Rights Teaching and completed internship at the UN Center for Human Rights Geneva, awarded Career Award 1994 for young talented teachers by the UDC, awarded Bharat Jyoti Award in 2006, recipient of University State Government National and UGC scholarships at different level of studies, recipient of eminent great personality of India, Award by Shaheed Memorial Seva Society in Lutiana in 2011. Conferred honorary rank of Colonel by National Credit Corporation in March 2014. DAV Educational Managing Committee. Conferred Vashish Saman, the highest award of DAV in April 2015. Award of Excellence for Outstanding Contribution. Conferred by Maharaja Agrasen University, Himachal Pradesh. And Shane Himachal Award conferred by uh, the uh, government of Himachal Pradesh in November 2016. Sir awarded Fulbright Fellowship by United States India Educational Foundation, New Delhi in 2017. Friends, if I start counting the contributions of Sir to this legal field, in fact, this particular session will short, fall short. And in fact, it's my honor and privilege that I'm inviting my guru, Professor Dr. Bean Jaswal, to address the participants. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chandrashree. My pleasure, sir. My uh, esteemed uh, elder brother, Professor Bari, Honorable Chancellor of uh, IMS University, Dharad Room, Professor Nishtha Jaswal, Honorable Vice Chancellor, HPNLU Shimla. Professor S.S. Jaswal, Registrar, HPLU Shimla, Dr. Grijay Shukla, Director of the Center, other uh, faculty members, participants, and dear students. At the very outset, I must uh, congratulate uh, HPNLU for uh, thinking of uh, organizing this uh, colloquium on the eve of uh, 37th year of Bhopal tragedy, with which uh, most of us, we are very well aware. The idea behind uh, remembering something good or bad is to rethink, reshape, and reformulate our plans for the future. If it is a bad thing, it should not be repeated it should be avoided. If it is a good thing, we should capitalize on such good happening. That is the basic idea when we celebrate or when we commemorate any event. <clears throat> Bhopal gas tragedy, Professor Upendra Bakshi rightly named as Bhoposhima, equating it with the Nagasaki and Hiroshima, nuclear bomb blast, which took place during the Second World War. By naming it a Bhopashima, what he meant was, the tragedy was not less than the use of the nuclear weapon, though there it was used intentional, here it may not be called intentional. The theme of uh, today's the colloquium is to discuss some of the unanswered questions. Since we all deal with the field of law, uh, I'll talk uh, a few legal questions which uh, are still to be answered. But uh, the real field of this international environmental law is of my elder brother. Uh, I would be eagerly looking forward to listen to uh, Professor Bari. After the Bhopal catastrophe, which resulted into the death of so many people, as Professor S.S. Jaswal explained, the different figures are coming. Some of the people, they got injured because of the poisonous nature of the gas, which was leaked from the Union Carbide plant. The, there was a challenge how to address 
the injury which the people has suffered. The Union Carbide, a foreign company, packed uh, itself and uh, went back to US. The question was of a jurisdiction. How to prosecute a foreign company in a local court or in the foreign court? Many lawyers, international lawyers, they came forward to fight the case in America, in India, and the matter was also debated within the government of India authorities and ultimately the Bhopal gas leak disaster processing of claims act 1985 was passed. The necessity of passing this law was because of the large number of people who had been affected, they required a dress and we wanted some money, some help to be paid by the company which was responsible for the disaster. Under the act, the government uh, applied the doctrine of uh, parents patriarchs and held that state can in exercise of its sovereign power for protecting the disabled victims of the industrial disaster take over the claims of the victim. Though this was a law passed by the Parliament of India and the constitutionality of this act has already been upheld by the Apex Court of India in Charanlal Sahu versus Union of India in 1993. But one of the main unanswered questions even today which haunts the legal minds is that despite the fact that the sovereign has the power to exercise the or apply the doctrine of parent patriarch. But can such kind of a disaster, which is labeled as a mass tort, which is equal to crime, that be compromised on behalf of the victim without their consent? and be taken over by the state? It's a question of legal debate. But one thing is certain, after the leakage of this gas, the legal recourse to the environmental protection and awarding of damages and the compensation that uh, was uh, ignited and a uh, number of steps were taken. We know it in India, the Environment Protection Act of 1986 came into existence. Prior to that, we were going in stages by step by step. We enacted after the 72 Stockholm Conference, we enacted the Water Act of 74, then we had a Forest Act of 88 and the Air Act of 1981, but the general legislation to cover such things, that was only in 86. And one of the reasons for enacting that law was this disaster. Then in the Supreme Court itself, because of a number of controversial unanswered questions, when the second leakage of gas took place after one year exactly in December 85 in Delhi, only what is called olive gas leakage case, then the Supreme Court decided in MC Mehta versus uh, Union of India 1987, another uh, very important case in this regard, because there was some similarity though the, the magnitude was not to the same extent as it was uh, in Bhopal case, uh, thankfully, uh, in Delhi leakage gas. There, the Supreme Court evolved certain principles. Justice Bhagwati, speaking for the court, distinguished the strict liability principle of Rayland versus Fracture of the 19th century with that of uh, MC Mehta and evolved the concept of absolute liability. While laying down the standards of compensation or the measure of compensation, the 
Supreme Court said that where an enterprise is engaged in a hazardous or inherently dangerous activity resulting, for example, in the escape of a toxic gas, the entire the enterprise is strictly and absolutely liable to compensate those and the liability shall be uh, or the measure of compensation must be correlated with the magnitude and the capacity of the enterprise. So what just Bhagavati thought at that time was that if there is a large uh, enterprise with the uh, good capacity to pay, the mayor of compensation should be more and the compensation must have the deterrent effect. But then this uh, particularly case opened up a, a one question in a subsequent case uh, of uh, the Bhopal tragedy itself, what is called Union Carbide Corporation versus the Union of India uh, of 1991, where uh, uh, the then Chief Justice, uh, Honorable uh, Justice Ranganath Mishra, he said that uh, in toxic mass thought like uh, Bhopal tragedy, which are actions arising out of uh, hazardous enterprise, the award of damages should be proportional to the economic capacity of the offender, cannot be pressed to assail the settlement which had reached the Bhopal disaster case. And I, as I said, Bhopal Gas Disaster Processing of Claim Act of 85 provided a fixed amount of compensation which was arrived at at the Supreme Court level, which Union Carbide was so happy to pay. But did that, the unanswered question is, did that compensation reach to each and every victim whose right to prosecute the offender had already been taken over by the state under the application of Dr. Parent Patriots. Though in the Union Carbide case, the Supreme Court had said that in case this uh, amount of settlement falls short to redress the grievances of the people who are the victims of the Bhopal tragedy, the government is to fill up the gap. The government of India is to provide the deficiency of uh, in, in uh, uh, beating the demand of money to provide uh, the relief to the victims. But the unanswered question is how that money which we received has been applied or used to redress the grievances of the victims. What steps we have taken thereafter on the part of the government which had made the settlement into the doctrine of parent patriarchs to see that proper health care, proper facility that is provided. One thing is certain that Bhopal tragedy has uh, help to us to formulate the precautionary principle of sustainable development. The three components of a precautionary principle that is uh, to anticipate, to prevent, and then to attack any possibility of uh, environmental degradation or environmental harm that has to be done and in that case, in, in case uh, we find uh, that uh, uh, there is a still leakage of a gas, then the liability has to be fixed. Even in uh, the Supreme Court, uh, subsequently in the case of uh, Deepak Nitrite uh, versus State of Gujarat in 2004, a doubt was raised. And the doubt was that uh, compensation to be awarded must have broad co-relationship not only with the magnitude and capacity of the enterprise but also with the harm caused by it. The Honorable Supreme Court uh, in Deepak Nitrite was of the view 
that if there is a mere violation of the law without resulting any injury to the individual, then the damages are not to be paid. Now, if we apply the ratio of this case, it goes contrary to what was decided by the Supreme Court in MC Mehta. So the question which is there is, which has been partially answered by the subsequent uh, uh, ruling of uh, the Research Foundation for Science versus the Union of India in 2005, that Deepak Nitrate cannot be said to have laid down the correct proposition that in the absence of actual degradation of the environment, we can uh, award the compensation or we can apply polluter pays principle or not. Because the polluter pays principle says the one who pollutes the environment, he has to pay the compensation in, uh, on two different grounds. One, to reverse back the environment to the original position. And secondly, the compensation to redress the injury which the people might have suffered as the people in Bhopal tragedy case or uh, Bhopal gas case suffered. So one of the uh, this unanswered question is the court has to lay down the categorical law. Of course, the suggestion of the court was there that we should have environment disaster fund. We had subsequently in uh, 1991, uh, the Public Liability Insurance Act. We The laws are being made, but uh, the main question which remains to be uns unanswered is, what about those victims who are still suffering after 37 years of this uh, tragedy, the Bhopal tragedy? That is uh, the main question and how we can make their life uh, comfortable or how we can ensure that uh, they get the proper treatment uh, in old age because those people, those who even were young, they are now in the, uh, they have already entered into the old age and they are still suffering with the side effect of the gas leakage care. Uh, I have tried my best to raise certain questions of law. Uh, I, I'm confident that my elder brother uh, will further elaborate uh, on this issue. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share my views on this colloquium of uh, on 37 year Bhopal tragedy, some unanswered question. Thank you one and all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us with your address. Friends, our next distinguished speaker and a chief guest of today's e colloquium is a renowned academician, Professor Dr. Gurdeep Singh Bhari. Professor Dr. Gurdeep Singh Bhari is a distinguished academician having over a 46 years of teaching and research experience. Uh, may, I, may I interrupt here? Sir? We all know each other so well. Sir, but the audience. I, I completely agree with you, sir. Business state of it. Uh, I right, sure. sir. Right, sir. The, right, sir. The so, beginning has been very right. So, this trend is already set by Professor Nishta Jaswal. Right, sir. Let us follow the same trend. As you say, sir. So, uh -huh. Huh, yes, Everybody sir. knows each other. Uh, huh? My brother, Professor Jaswal, is here. Paramjit Singh Jaswal. Nishta ji. Everybody, almost everyone knows yes, each sure, other. Yes. So, do away with this formal introduction part. As you say. Not to me straight away. Okay. In fact, sir, the, um, the presence of uh, your presence in this colloquium, in fact, is the reflection of the importance of this particular, you can say, colloquium, I should say. So, sir, now I most humbly request our chief guest of today's program, Professor Dr. Gurdeep Singh Bhari, to address the audience. Over to you, sir. Professor Dr. Nishta Jaswal, my very dear brother, Professor P.S. Jaswal, Grijesh, sitting here, who is perhaps uh, the planner 
of today's event, being head of the center, all the participants. Very good morning to all of you. And I really thank Professor Nishta for giving me the floor today on a very, very important day, on a very important day. And unfortunately, 37 years after the tragedy, people have forgotten about it. Legal scholars are not able to forget, but the public has forgotten. Very rare universities are celebrating the anniversary. I'm so glad and thrilled all the credit goes to Himachal Pradesh National Law University for celebrating the day and reminding all of us what is already known to us. Are we able to answer the unanswered questions of this horrendous tragedy? Well, you have already heard my brother. Everybody is enlightened in detail about the tragedy, about the unanswered questions. But what really is shocking, before I really proceed to the text, I may remind you that yesterday also was very important. National Environment Protection Day. Celebrated in most of the colleges in Delhi University by way of different, different green initiatives that adds to the importance of today's event. My dearest friends, what really shocks us the way the Bhopal adjudication went on. True, immediately after this tragedy, two American lawyers initiated legal action in a district court there on behalf of all the victims of Bhopal. Later on, Union of India also filed a petition. All the petitions were consolidated and tried as one. What really shocks us all, all of us here is the way our own government <laughs> represented in the District Court of United States. Judge Keenan was sitting there. The union of government tried to convince the court that American forum was convenient for them, adequate for them, and not the Indian forum. Look at the reasons given by the Indian government. The first reason was our judicial system paralyzed by colonialism, British colonialism, was not competent, was not developed enough to deal with such kind of tragedy. As a matter of fact, our government went on to add that even the bar and the bench was not competent to handle such an specialized case involving expertise, different kind of special expertise. We made our judicial system a subject matter of ridicule publicly in a foreign court. 
the second reason pointed out by Union of India seems more plausible. That Union Carbide Corporation, incorporated in the United States, would not submit to the jurisdiction of Indian judicial system if the case was filed here. Therefore, U.S. forum would be adequate, convenient forum. And the third reason was, in the opinion of the government, Union of India, American courts would award higher compensation in comparison to Indian courts. This really brought incredibility to Indian judicial system as such. Shocking for the judiciary. And you know who filed affidavit on behalf of Union of India? A professor, Mark Glenter, a Fulbright fellow working in the Faculty of Law of Delhi University at that time. He filed an affidavit on behalf of Union of India, imposing the incapability of Indian judicial system to handle the specialized litigation. <clears throat> well, and the interesting fact here is that Union Carbide Corporation filed affidavits of two prominent Indian jurists well known to all of us, Palkiwala and Dada Chanchi. Both of them went on to depose that our judicial system was competent to handle such adjudication. Our bar was competent enough, our bench was competent enough to handle the litigation and to get the relief also. Now, foreign corporation filing affidavits of Indian jurists, our own government filing the affidavit of an American scholar, Mark Glenter, working in India, of course, as Fulbright fellow, <laughs> as many do. You know, very funny situation, very funny situation. Look at the way the case was handled. Ultimately, Keenan dismissed the case on the basis of forum non-convenience. He had to, deciding that the Indian forum was convenient and adequate forum, and not the U.S. forum. It went to Court of Appeals. Certain conditions were altered, but then the ruling was upheld, that of dismission. U.S. Supreme Court also dismissed, of course, with some modification of conditions and all that. Finally, look, when the case was pending in the United States, a petition was filed by Union of India in the District Court of Bhopal during the pendency of that litigation. Decision took place much, much later. And the proceedings started in Indian courts. You are all aware about those proceedings. You know about how District Judge Dio handled the controversy. When the case went to Bhopal High Court, Justice Seth was sitting there. Now the basic question, look, which you have also to ponder is, it's a question of multinational corporations liability. Now, the Indian subsidiary who was running the undertaking here was UCIL, Union Carbide India Limited, a subsidiary of UCC. Now the parent company UCC would be liable only if the corporate wheel can be lifted 
and the real face of the undertaking is seen. The issue before Justice Seth was whether the corporate wheel of UCIL could be lifted and the real face could be seen. If the real face was that of UCC, then UCC would have the liability. You know, very interesting corporate issue was involved here. And Seth had no difficulty in deciding that this is a fit case for lifting of corporate wheel because the parent company designed the plant. The parent company owned the plant. The parent company controlled the functioning of the plant. Therefore, Justice Seth had it a fit case for lifting corporate and went on to pronounce on the liability issue. Well, you know, the judgments of both the courts, the Supreme Court ultimately held it a fit case for settlement because the assets were of UCC in India were inadequate to satisfy the award if made. When the adjudication was pending in the United States, UCC made an offer to settle the case in 350 US dollars million US dollars, I'm sorry, 350 million US dollars that time. But it was not acceptable to the government because government wanted much more, about 3.3 billion against a large, you know, multinational UCC. Ultimately, Justice Pathak, the Chief Justice at that time, very important person for all of us because he became judge of the International Court of Justice as well. And he wrote uh, a foreword to one of my books, Global Environmental Change and International Law. Grigations is perhaps. He preferred the settlement because he felt there would be execution problems in India. And the American courts, if we go for execution there, American courts may or may not accept the verdict of Indian court. So in all fairness, he decided to settle. He took cognizance of the fact that UCC made an offer of 350 million US dollars when the case was pending in the United States. Look, how Patak arrived at the amount, the modus operandi he adopted in the case for deciding the amount. UCC, 350 million US dollars, while the case was pending in US. Indian government agreed at about uh, 500 million US dollars, finally. During adjudication, Indian government agreed in so many words that we would be ready to settle in 500 million US dollars. Now, Potter thought 350 million dollars as agreed by UCC plus interest would amount to 426 US dollars. Indian government wanted 500 million dollars. When the settlement is made, it is made in between. So, Pathak decided the figure now. Modus of Prandai I have given you. And fixed the settlement at 470 million US dollars, closer to what India agreed to settle. 500 million. 
you know, not exactly in between, but closer to Indian figure. The case was settled. Now, everybody says, rightly so, it's a missed, missed opportunity. The Supreme Court was having the opportunity to decide the issue of amount of compensation. Because the compensation was by all means not adequate to compensate the victims and restore the damaged environment also. Therefore, amount required was much more. And the Supreme Court did not talk about the nature of liability. In cases of such serious accidents involving out of handling of his orders and inherently dangerous substance. Like in this case, it is methyl isocyanate which leaked accidentally and caused the damage in a factory manufacturing pesticides, same in and same in. said and done. No observation on merits, review petition was filed at the time when Justice Ranganath Mishra was Chief Justice. And Justice Ranganath Mishra made various observations. Earlier, in the settlement, even criminal proceedings were quashed. Let me tell you. Justice Ranganath Mishra had set aside that part of the judgment, quashing criminal proceedings, and decided criminal proceedings against erring corporate officials would continue. Because these were for commission of non-compoundable, cognizable offenses. These could not be compounded during a settlement. Well, things went on. You know, the after effects of this tragedy. It was settled that the liability of the polluter would be unlimited. But then insurance companies refused to issue insurance policies to the polluters because the liability was unlimited and they were not permitted, uh, they were not in fact prepared issue insurance policy for unlimited liability of the airing corporation. Well, the businesses were in real trouble. Under these circumstances, Public Liability Insurance Act was incorporated. Again, under the Act, the liability of the insurance company would be limited to the policy, insurance policy. But liability of the polluter would continue to be unlimited. It is for this reason that a provision was made in the Act for the establishment of environment compensation mechanism and there was a fund created environment uh, compensation fund and the polluter while obtaining the policy would deposit an amount equal to that of his premium of his insurance policy with the environment relief act I don't know why this is losing in between.
sir you are audible hear me it doesn't matter if you are not able to look at my picture i will continue speaking yeah, yes sir i will continue speaking yes sir yes sir my picture is not seen don't bother about it you have, I... have already seen me enough now even thereafter so it might happen that even after meeting the liability by the insurance company which is limited to the policy environment relief fund the portion of liability remains and the polluter would be held liable to pay that much to satisfy that much liability which he owns under the limit unlimited liability well if you combine it with shriram gas leakage which happened in delhi not of uh, the same magnitude as bopal my dear brother has rightly pointed out this is a surprising incident i am not able to forget it and digest it i was sitting with my friend thomas dog who was financial attache in the us high commission we were chatting in the us high commission itself and all of a sudden he informs me for the there is a gas leakage here at najafgarh road near these azari courts and uh, even one advocate has died working at these azari courts huge gas leakage i knew about that leakage for the first time because he gave me the first hand information you got already you have read it very thoroughly you know the absolute liability principle evolved by the supreme court for holding the polluter liable and then for deciding the magnitude quantum of liability deep pocket theory the liability of the polluter depends upon as my friend this wall rightly told you the capacity of the polluter to pay it depends upon the deepness of the pocket of the polluter the liability would much be much much more if the pocket of the polluter is deeper deeper the pocket more the quantum of compensation to be paid well deep pocket theory was entirely a new theory propounded at that time by the supreme court things went on and the moment came when all the courts scholars everybody felt the need to have specialized environmental courts with specialized environmental courts in mind in 2010 national green tribunal act was passed and national green tribunal was established with its principal branch at delhi and other branches one at bhopal second at uh, pune third at calcutta and fourth at chennai principal branch delhi other branches at four places that of bhopal pune calcutta and chennai now here is a national green tribunal established which would have the jurisdiction to adjudicate the cases like bhopal all environmental cases 
look at the change. If you read the act, I'm sure you must have read those who are into environmental law. You must have read the act as such. You must be knowing fully well about the jurisdiction part, scope of the jurisdiction. But the interesting fact here is The principles to be applied by the tribunal are the principles of international environment. The tribunal has the power to decide cases on the basis of number one, sustainable development, well known principle of international environmental law, deeply embedded in international environmental law. Polluter pays principle, again, an important limb of sustainable development. And precautionary principle, a second limb of sustainable development. I have always been rather preaching that the fort of sustainable development, the structure of sustainable development, rests on these two important pillars, namely polluter based principle and precautionary principle. Both are, all these are principles of international environment. But then look at the trouble here, which starts here. The access so sustainable development, polluter pays for deciding the quantum of compensation and precautionary principle, which is a helping mechanism. Now, the act does not define as to what is the meaning of sustainable development. What is the meaning of polluter based principle? What is the meaning of precautionary principle? Without defining the principles, the tribunal is made to apply these principles and these principles are of international environment. So we are taking for granted that it is here that international and environmental law has percolated into the body of Indian environmental law. National Green Tribunal Act of 2010. Thereafter many cases have been decided but then this part remains disputable part. My dear friends, remember, when we talk of sustainable development, it is not mere economic development and ecological development, the balancing of the two. There is a third very important component, which is social development. And international, the mandate of international law is very clear. Clear in the sense that sustainable development signifies the balanced synthesis of economic development, ecological development, and social development. And things go on and on. Then we had sustainable development goals adopted in 2015 and applicable between 2015 to 2030. Well, things went on. But the fact remains that we in Indian law, including environment, like this Green Tribunal Act, we do not have the definition of these important principles, which are very much part of Indian law. My dear friends, now that after the tragedy, you have seen the unanswered questions, the unanswered questions. Now, nuclear energy is obviously out of hazardous and inherently dangerous substances. It is out because it is governed under the different act, Atomic Energy Act, having various rules thereof, there under. Various rules amended from time to time, from time to time, on various aspects, various forms. My dear friends, the time is ripe now 
for all of us to act jointly if we have to protect the environment, if we have to avoid, prevent such types of horrendous accidents. And uh, the matter was, in fact, agitated in the Supreme Court. Yesterday, we have a very important judgment of the Supreme Court, wherein the Supreme Court apprised the center and Delhi government about the rising magnitude of air pollution in Delhi. Day before, the air pollution, measured air pollution in Delhi was 326 AQI. And yesterday it became 426. Look at the jump, how it rose. At one time it touched 500 AQI. Very, very, very dangerous level. Delhi has become a pollution bomb. And the Supreme Court, in fact, slapped the center and Delhi government ask them to go ahead and take urgent measures within 24 hours. Take effective measures and report the measures to the Supreme Court within 24 hours. What they have done. I was so glad to look at the news today that only, only hours before the government has directed the Air Quality Management Commission to set up a task force. You know why the direction came so expeditiously? Because the Supreme Court threatened that if government did not, the Supreme Court itself would set up a task force to deal with the problem. Now that the government has passed the direction to Air Quality Management Commission to set up the task force, which would come out with various proposals, various solutions to avoid this rising problem of air pollution. Now, how to stop? vehicular pollution, how to stop industrial pollution, how to minimize all of it. The students have started already in various colleges coming out with plantation drive, coming out with uh, driving a bicycle instead of their motor vehicle, or just walking down on foot. Different, different, whatever the students could think of, they have started. But we all have to act jointly. It's a very serious problem. You know, it gives rise to acid rain. It gives rise to extinction of biodiversity. It gives rise to deadly problem of climate change. All the time we are talking of climate justice and legal measures to prevent climate justice, Paris Agreement, and post-Paris Agreement, but then the joint action is required. And I'm so glad that such events are being organized, and Himachal Pradesh National Law University has taken the lead under the very, very competent leadership of Professor Mishra this fall. Thank you very much. We hope for the best. But the only part of our duty is to do whatever we can at least do jointly in this direction. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My privilege. Thank, thank you, sir, for your valuable and very important address. And so I completely, in fact, you rightly said that we all have jointly come together in order to prevent Bhopal-like blunders or disasters. 
and this is in fact a learning experience by listening to such a distinguished panel of speakers. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks again. Friends, the roots of all the goodness lie in the soil of appreciation for goodness. Now, I invite Dr. Vijay Shukla, Director of Center of Environment and Disaster Management, to propose a vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Chandrishwari. I take this opportunity to uh, propose the vote of thanks as a formal uh, process. But before, I wish to say a few lines. I was reading somewhere yesterday that Bhopal gas disaster could be a disaster for Indians, could be a disaster for our fellow people who lost their lives, who lost their loved ones. But as far as the company is concerned, on the same day when the settlement was declared, the UCC share rose to 7%. The company which was losing at that point of time in terms of their total corporate value has uh, gone up by 7%, which means that make the company much more richer after paying this uh, whatever good or bad amount. That's what kind of legal system, that's what kind of uh, economic system we have here. Thank you, sir, uh, for enlightening us today. And I know uh, with short duration, you accepted the uh, uh, chief guest, being chief guest here for this program. And uh, I still remember uh, since 2004, I have been your student. And uh, the same deal, the same kind of curiosity, same kind of question making in the class, which is often known as a trademark of Professor Gurdeep Singh Bahari, is still there at this age also. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us, for guiding our students, our participants. And uh, your line that we have to actuate these international environmental law principles is really going to be a kind of theme for all of us for coming uh, years to protect us, to protect the uh, country, to protect the uh, environment as such. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being with us. I take this opportunity to pose my word of thanks to Professor uh, Paranjit, sir, uh, a, a person unparalleled in field of environment law. In his erudite scholarly uh, uh, you know, lecture, I was counting, he has raised more than 10 questions. And when yesterday I was reading that paper, I thought that what kind of questions are yet to be answered? Most of the things are answered. But after listening to Professor Jaswal, I'm sure that we need to write afresh, we need to start afresh to think about these disasters, especially to protect our uh, future from such possibility. Somebody has said that there was first world war, there was second, there could be a third, but there will be no fourth. In the same manner, there is a one Bhopal disaster. There could be second one, but probably no third. Because after that, probably we will not be there to see any such disaster. So thank you, sir, for asking us to be a little more alert in terms of legal questions, at least. Uh, and uh, I'm sure the program being the brainchild of, uh, of our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Nishtha Jaswal, and uh, in her poetic manner, the way she has started this session, you can uh, feel the thrill of uh, her concern about the human life, even through this virtual mode. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for uh, guiding us. Thank you for guiding this center towards uh, somewhere remembering those lives which were lost and the opportunity which we lost uh, by not taking uh, those concerns carefully. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I hope that the center in your guidance, in your uh, patronage will do much more in coming days. I take this opportunity to express my gratitude to uh, Sir S.S. Jaswal, registrar, uh, who in his uh, untiring approach towards the university has always done whatever possible uh, to you know, uh, 
do academic works, curricular and extracurricular activity, and contribute in every possible manner. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Jaswal. I take this opportunity to say my special thanks on behalf of the center to Dr. Chandreshwari, all the volunteers of this program, and uh, members of the CEDM, also the administrative staff, Mr. Hemraj and others, who has contributed a lot in this program as a, uh, as a successful program. I seek uh, blessings of all of you for uh, all of our future endeavors and uh, take permission from Honorable Vice Chancellor to declare the program's closer. Thank you, Bridesh. God bless all of us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bari. Thank you, Professor Jaswal. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Thanks Thank you, to everyone.